Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to Criterion Critics. Here we're here for our second episode, and this time we're reviewing. This is Bobby's pick, correct? Correct. All right, we're reviewing 1960s Spartacus, the number 105 in the Criterion Collection uh, releases. And before we get started in the review, uh, let's first talk about some of the criterions that came out in January, uh, just last month, of the most recent releases and what we think is going to be the highlight of the releases and which one we're going to run out and pick up. Uh, First and foremost, on January 8th, we have 24 frames coming out. January 15th, uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious. January 22nd, we have two films coming out, Mikey and Nikki. And four months, three weeks, and two days. And on January 29th, uh, the classic In the Heat of the Night gets a Criterion release. All these are brand new releases. None of these are re-releases on Blu-ray for the first time. Gentlemen, Bobby, starting with you, which one of these do you eye as something that needs to be added to your collection? Uh, In the Heat of the Night would be the one of that list that I would choose, and followed by Notorious. So, because those are the ones that I honestly know most about, and I would like to know more about in the background. The other ones, I, to be honest, I don't even really know what they are. <laughs> Shane, as the film critic, I'm sure you know what they are. <laughs> well, I've I've seen all four Ara uh, and four films, but 24 Frames I haven't seen, and I believe that's a documentary, but I I am aware of it. Um, it's tough because I'm such a Hitchcock cinephile. I would definitely say Notorious. Uh, however, Mikey and Nikki is actually a really intriguing film, and In the Heat of the Night's just a classic. As for four months, three weeks, and two days, uh, once was enough for me. That was just a foreign, <laughs> foreign film that's tough to watch, tough subject matter. I can see why it's getting a Criterion release. It's, it has a, a bit of a, a cult following, and it did did quite well critically. But um, if I was under pressure to say one, I would definitely go with Alfred Hitchcock, Notorious. All right, I'm going to have to agree with Shane on this one. Uh, Of these five films, only one of them currently exists in my video library, and that's Notorious as a DVD. I've never upgraded it to Blu-ray, so now that I can get it a Blu-ray and in Criterion, uh, that's definitely going to be added to my library. And I am a huge, huge Alfred Hitchcock fan, and this is also one of the films that I studied when I was in film school for a little while, so I have a lot of... uh, good memories of uh, talking about that film for extended periods of time. So that is definitely the one I'm going to add in the heat of the night. It's a close second though. That's one I do enjoy. And I agree with, yeah, I agree with Shane that I, I, I've not seen Mikey and Nikki, but I read about it and I'm interested. I, I is maybe one I pick up on a, on a whim at some point in time. So uh, the other two are less interested, but I'm sure we'll get to reviewing them at some point in time. All right, but before we get into our review of Spartacus, we started this last month, thought it was fun. What film would you still, or would you like to see put into a Criterion version uh, that has not been done yet? Shane. Oh, oh, I'd love to say, I'll go with an Australian film. I think Mad Max, the original Mad Max, needs a great, solid Mm. Criterion version. I don't disagree with you on that one. That's a really solid pick. (laughs) Yep, Bobby. Uh, we did a podcast on this a uh, few months ago that needs it. It's and it's going to be remade uh, very soon. Is Nightmare Alley? I think that one deserves a Criterion release. It's a very good movie that no one's really heard about, and it has a wonderful backstory to it. That where you have infighting between the head of the studio and the star of the movie. Uh, with an alternate ending. So I think that would be a really interesting choice to put into a criterion and de- well worth watching. 
Solid pick as well. Uh, mine, I'm going to go a little bit more obs obscure, a little a little foreign, at least for, well, it'll be foreign for Shane as well. Infernal <laughs> Affairs, uh, the basically the original film that created the that the departed is the remake of i really like that film and it is a one that i would love to see a criterion of to have some sort of discussion and uh, possibly see if there's some sort of making of documentaries out there on it i'd be very curious to see more see and hear about the making of that film a little bit more i i also like the remake the departed though i know they were different but both films have their um different virtues and i think both if they were standalone films they were just i think they're incomparable they're really good good choices to watch no i i, I like the departed a lot it, obviously a much more stellar cast in the departed uh it's but it's a little americanized it's a little bit i i don't know i think the kind of the the rawness of the film it's it's a little more polished and i like the rawness of infernal affairs yep all right well with that out of the way let's get into our review of spartacus before we get into the criterion review once again we'll remind our new audience that this isn't so much a review of the film as much as a, a review of the criterion release of it uh, spartacus has only been released on dvd at this point in time uh, so you have to actually go out there. It is still available for sale. I, hap I happen to look today that you could still order Spartacus on DVD. So it does exist out there. It has not been upgraded to Blu-ray. But before we get there, let's talk about our experience with the film. Bobby, when was the first time you saw Spartacus? And uh, this is your pick. So uh, what mm -hmm. caused you to want to pick this as your first pick in Criterion Critics? The first time I saw this was I started watching it when I was a kid on in black and white long, long ago, and I never got through it because it was such a long movie. But and I believe they actually had it over two days uh, when they released it um, on television, and then I watched it uh, at length when I was at the video store in the early '90s on VHS, and and that was the last time I had seen it until this time on DVD. So and why I chose it was actually this uh, – when we started talking about doing the Criterions, I had a limited library, and this was one of my favorites of the ones that I had at the time. I, my choices probably would, cha would have changed by now, but <laughs> with all the collecting that everybody's been doing uh, <laughs> over the last few months. But it's a solid film, so I thought it was very much worthy of, of doing – um, you know, it's, it's it's only been released once on DVD, so I thought it would be a really good choice for the podcast to start with. Shane, what about your experience with uh, Spartacus? Oh, I came onto it pretty late because I never – I'm pretty sure I only saw it in two or three parts. It might have been playing on television, and we might have recorded it on VHS at home when I was a kid, and I just used to put it on and watch it in segments. So until I bought the Criterion DVD, the disc here I've got in my hands – that was the, probably, I would say, the first time I've actually watched it in full, you know, all 196 minutes of it. And um, I think Gladiator, too, even though Gladiator is obviously a different realm of the film, was made in the 90s, it sort of still brought the attention back to Spartacus and made more people want to watch it again. So I'm really glad I got a chance to, to get the Criterion. It's such a great, great copy, especially the restoration, but we'll get into that. All right, so did you just recently watch it in it, in its entirety for this podcast? I certainly did. Yeah, oh, that's wow. what I mean. I'm pretty sure as I was watching it, I'm thinking there are things here I don't remember. So I am assuming that I've never actually seen it from start to finish in full. So it was wonderful to do that, do just that with the DVD. All right. Well, I thought I was going to be the late bloomer of this group. I didn't <laughs> see it until. I, I was when they did the restoration in 1991. It got a theatrical release. I didn't catch it in the theaters, but when it came out on VHS, I did catch it on VHS. When I worked at Blockbuster, rented it I, because of the additional footage. I rented it once, watched it, liked it, enjoyed the film, but I had never seen it again since. Not on any kind of Blu-ray or, or DVD version since, and so I saw it on the small screen, a very small screen, probably at the time. So watching it now, I watched it on with you know with surround sound on the my big you know sixty inch television, 
uh, this was the first time I probably really appreciated a lot of Spartacus and I was really appreciated the film in its entirety much more now and I thought I would be the the one that would be like apologizing for coming to it late but Shane needs to do it because he should <laughs> have seen this a lot that's, that's me this time um, but I've got to say Bobby you said you watched it in black and white that must have been a different sort of experience in itself it was uh, when I was when I grew up we had a 19 inch black and white until I was 18 years old we you just did. didn't have we and so basically that's how we saw movies so anything widescreen was chopped into full you know into full frame pan, um, and, scan. pan and scan exactly and you've got like I said this came was released I believe in different parts over different days because it was such a long movie and when you can't record like you can with TiVo and and recordings today, you know, basically if you missed it, you missed it. And so that was my yeah. first experience of it. So when I saw this, I like Patrick said, when it was released on a VHS for the first time with restored footage on it, I watched it and I really, and obviously in color this time, but, and I want to say this also, was this letterbox Patrick where it had the black, lines I, at the top i, I want to you know they release letterbox and pan and scan i want to say the version i saw was pan and scan but okay. i'm pretty sure because i was a huge fan of letterbox mm -hmm. that there was a letterbox version that i eventually because i know i ordered i created letterbox sections at my blockbuster for mm -hmm. films and I, I probably ordered it and i i almost distinctly remember the box so it probably existed <laughs> Yeah, that's. I think that was what I saw was the letterbox version because I'm like you. I I love to. I I pan and scan is not my thing. I really like to see the entire screen in front of me, even if it's tiny. I'd rather see all of it than only parts of it. So that was uh, as far as the the quality of what I saw back in the 90s, and obviously back in the 70s, it was black and white, terrible uh, quality <laughs> for me. But you know, to see it now, like. Patrick said on a giant screen high resolution television this is a different movie and this is I mean I'm not I'm sorry to say I'm not a huge Lawrence of Arabia fan because it's just too much for me but this to me is on that same level it's just it's gorgeous and and it's one of those that I think it needed to be put out for the high res type of televisions today and Bobby I'm glad to hear that I was not the uh, you only family that had a 19-inch uh, black and white television in their house because <laughs> we had a color television, but that's the television my parents watched. If yeah. we wanted to watch television, we had to go to my parents' room and watch it in their room, and it was only the small television black and white. So cartoons did not really have as much effect for me as they did. <laughs> well, I, we had the 19-inch for the family, and then if we wanted to watch our own, I, I think I was about 12 or 13, I went to a garage sale, and I think I got like a 5-inch little television radio combination and that's what I, I could if i with my rabbit ears i might have gotten one or two channels on that so <laughs> that's how bad i was yeah, so I, I, that's yeah, true was, <laughs> the rabbit ears too i remember that like don't yeah. bump the television yeah. you're gonna lose the yeah, channel okay. i gotta hold the tip i've got to bend the thing just right and i'll hold it for the next two hours while i watch this i mean it was it was bad stuff shane you're too young for that <laughs> I, I, I've seen them in movies, but I've never had to adjust them. <laughs> I'm telling you, Shane, it sucked. It sucked bad. <laughs> when, uh, when your nickname is Antenna, it's a bad, you know, bad thing in the family. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get on to a review of the Criterion. First, as I stated before, there was only one release of this. It's on DVD. Uh, the cover is pretty basic. It's very artistic. It looks like some of the original artwork used in the promotional material, at least after I watched all the promotional material uh, images that are on the Criterion of Spartacus in white lettering, a black or sorry, a red background and a uh, a black gladiator, not Spartacus himself, in the foreground. Um, what do you guys think of the artwork to the the uh, the criterion set i'm assuming yours is the same at least in australia shane yeah mine's exactly the same as you described it and i thought it might have been made just for the criterion you know new artwork but you're right when you when you go through the um the extra feature of the promotional um posters it is part of that and i quite like it i i think it's quite effective i think less is more sometimes and this one works for me bobby 
Uh, I'll disagree. I I believe that the DVD version of this, uh, I don't remember which studio put it out, but it has uh, Kirk Douglas on the front on a horse w- raising his sword, That it, which is also in the promotional. They have a picture of him doing that. I yeah. believe that's, that's a more effective poster than this is. I think this is a little too plain for me. I do love the lettering, the Spartacus lettering on it. I think that's wonderful. But yeah, I think it would have been better to have had a, a a shot of of the actual uh, gladiator or Spartacus himself on the on the cover. I have to say, when I first got it, I, I was kind of surprised at the simplicity of the cover because this is an epic film, and there's so much yeah. to this that I was taken back by it. But uh, the cover has grown on me, and the time that I've had it, and especially after watching and then seeing that there was some of the original promotional art, I like the throwback aspect of uh, putting this in there. And, and using that on the cover. So I've grown to like it. Uh, but I, I started out where Bobby was at, where I was going, oh, I don't, that's, it, is this a different Spartacus? Is this the one with the, like, <laughs> Douglas? I was like, I'm not watching a different one, am I? So There was a TV show, Spartacus, from memory, but I never watched it. Oh, it was. Showtime, wasn't it? Uh, no, I think it was Stars, and stars. it was basically yeah. porn. Uh, <laughs> but, well, it was, I watched the first. I think I watched the first season and then the prequel season before they, and I never came back to the second full season of Spartacus. Uh, and I think that's when they replaced the actor. I didn't, I never finished the series. It was okay. Um, it, it, what I saw was basically the first third of the film to the, to the revolt at the gladiator camp. And that's as far as I got in the story. So it, it's, it's obviously expounding upon the basic nature of what the original film was about. I'm glad I missed it then. <laughs> I don't know if it's worth four or five seasons you, you, or whatever. You didn't miss it. Yeah. You didn't miss it. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the conversion quality, although I've already, and Bobby's already have touched upon it, seeing it on uh, our big screen televisions with surround sound. Uh, Shane, what did you think of the conversion for the DVD version of this film? Uh, well, because I've had very little uh, memory of watching it, if I did actually watch bits and pieces of it on TV or VHS, whatever it was, I can only go by what um, the comparisons that they make on one of the documentaries about, you know, restoring it. So as expected, the Criterion has done a wonderful job in tandem with Universal and then original, you know, negatives to colorize it and make it just beautiful. So I'm very, very happy with how it's been restored. Bobby? Totally, 100% with what Shane just said. The the conversion was fantastic. I don't think that, that – there may be a Blu-ray version of this someday that is probably a little – a, a little better uh, resolution wise but as far as the colors and the the beauty of this movie i i'm completely satisfied with the dvd conversion it's it's a glorious movie on a big screen obviously this film seeing it on the big screen with the surround sound uh, i was dazzled at the picture quality the colors of the film very vibrant it definitely has much more of an epic feel than the pan and scan i probably saw in the mid 90s well, in the battles, the battle sequence. I thought that last battle sequence was phenomenal, which I did not have the the epic feel of it on any of the incarnations I had seen prior. So, watching it on the big screen, I really I saw the grandness of that. So, it, it made a huge difference on the audience. I have one complaint, at least on my version, and I don't know if it was from my Blu-ray player or because I was playing the DVD on a Blu-ray player, but I had it on two separate televisions. So I'm pretty sure it, I, if it was possibly, it's just my version, hopefully not your versions. I had a blue ghost image on the left-hand side of the screen that just kept reappearing every once in a while. And it was somewhat of a distraction, usually in the darker scenes and scenes during the daylight. Didn't notice it hardly at all, but at darker scenes, uh, like in the dungeons, it was it would be there, and it was just very very slight. Uh, n- did not take away from the film, but I thought it was it was something that I did notice. And did you guys notice that at all uh, with your versions? Uh, I I never did. No, I didn't catch my eye. I think it was Charles Naughton come back to haunt you. <laughs> his, his ghost of him and saying, why didn't what you pick this film? What is interesting with the restoration side of it is you watch the film and it's there is in the restored version and it's just beautiful, I thought it was. And then you go and watch the trailer 
which they never ever <laughs> com companies never spend time on actually trying to restore the trailer as well i know it's extra time and extra money but then you can just do a, a, a real quick comparison by by watching an original trailer and then an, a, a restored movie it's crazy the differences i know and i yeah. you know i agree with you shane that you know that, that that at least that gives you the distinction of hey this is the restored cut and this is what it would have looked like if they'd done nothing but why don't they restore trailers? I love trailers. I mean, exactly. even for old films. Yeah. And you're talking yeah. about two or three minutes. It can't take you that long to restore that, especially if you're already restoring the same image from the film. And a lot of trailers, even, uh, even today, will have additional footage that is not in the film. And it, some of it can be visually stunning in itself. So I wish they would restore trailers. I don't understand why they don't spend... You, you spend millions of dollars restoring... A three hour and 16 minute film what's two extra minutes i mean what yeah what? i thought we'd all be in agreement on, on that <laughs> mm -hmm. totally with you all right the extras on the criterion disc oh my gosh uh, hours and hours <laughs> oh my gosh yes <laughs> we have and i'm sorry to have <laughs> recommended this <laughs> well it's okay i wanted to watch the film four times uh <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly a we three and a half hour movie four times yeah we have the uh restoration from 1991 uh we have uh it, which has the 5.1 surround soundtrack we have the audio commentary with kirk douglas uh, peter ustinov novelist howard fast and producer or producer edward lewis restoration expert Rich robert harris and designer saul bass these they were not all in the same room together discussing it, so it's a little bit different commentary. And of note, this is a commentary that apparently was associated with the 1991 version of the film before Kirk Douglas had had a stroke, because I was concerned when I saw that there was a commentary. I went, <laughs> didn't he have a stroke in the mid-90s? And isn't that going to... I, you know, is, am I going to be able to understand him? No, it's very much uh, pre-stroke Kirk Douglas. This was associated with the 1991 version um, I think it was the Laserdisc release of the film is where it was originally. So this is not unique to the Criterion. Then we have uh, screenwriter Dalton Trumbo's scene-by-scene -scene analysis of the film that runs throughout the entire film. Uh, Alex North's score composition uh, that, 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 that runs behind the entire film. The restoration demonstration, as uh, Shane has already referenced, uh, is it's very very brief, but it's very it, it shows you the Active. distinction. Yeah, it was very some deleted scenes, not as many as I thought there would be, but I know yeah. I know the 1991 film restored a lot of dis deleted scenes. The, the vintage newsreel footage, which I think is really cool, that you see the the film newsreels from yeah. the 1960s of uh, just like news around the world, but news specifically about Spartacus. Uh, 1960 promotional interviews with Gene Simmons as well as Peter Ustinov. Fairly brief, but kind of entertaining. A 1992 video interview with Peter Ustinov, which is a little bit longer and I thought actually more entertaining and more informative. Uh, behind the scenes gladiatorial school footage of uh, the, basically the actors training to be gladiators from the film. A 1960 documentary about the Hollywood 10. Yes, my gosh, we keep going. Uh, plus archival documents about the blacklist, because uh, there's the whole blacklist issue with the screenwriter in this film. The original storyboards by uh, Saul Bass. Hundreds of productions, and we do mean hundreds, and of, hundreds. <laughs> of production stills, lobby cards, posters, print ads, and even some pages from a comic book that was apparently that was at least in production. It wasn't the entire comic book, but it was some of it. Some sketches by director Stanley Kubrick, uh, apparently probably how he wanted the shots for his cinematography, how he wanted the shots to be laid out. And then that finally, Kirk Douglas vetoed. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> and then finally the original theatrical trailer that was not restored as we've already discussed. So yes, I, I wish I would have clocked the amount of time I spent <sighs> watching this film, but with all the commentaries and you know behind the scenes discussion during the playing of the film you're probably talking about close to 12 hours there and then all the additional stuff maybe 13 14 hours of material here would you say bobby oh yeah <laughs> uh, the, to be honest this this actually felt like 
I was going to gladiator school. It just, <laughs> I, I felt it, it went on and on and on to the point where as much as I love this movie, I was tired of this movie. It was like, I, I got it. I, I you know, I, I'm good. <laughs> I mean, one more commentary saying exactly the same stuff, you know, with, with a slight, you know, a, a different angle is all it, it, it does get old after a while. Uh, I, I have to say as, uh, and it is a fantastic movie, great backstory and, you know, some wonderful, wonderful observations, but damn, this was long. <laughs> Shame. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. I love Criterion releases. I really do. Because the treasures, they kind of vary from disc to disc, of course, but they usually remain consistent, you know, with incredible information. But I've got a confession to make because I got through the audio commentary with, you know, the multiple people on it, uh, the Kirk Douglas one, and I thought it was good how they – the, the voice introduced them as they went too. I thought that was really good because that doesn't always happen on commentaries. But when it came to Dalton Trumbo's scene by scene, I have to say that I did kind of fast forward some of that. <laughs> it was a little monotonous. And I think the backstory and everything on Trumbo is fantastic. You know, they touch on it here in, in some of the stuff that they have on show, but uh, and then when it came to the other one, the, the music score compilation one, that again, I didn't go through it all. So I'm sorry, boys, but I didn't actually sit through those extra two. Well, the Dalton Trumbo one, I actually have watched the the documentary on, on Trumbo himself where they're interviewing him. And then I've watched the movie Trumbo, and I, I, I have him down. And so listening to him talk about this basically being backstabbed and how you know this was his way back in. And I mean, it just keeps going on and on and on. It, it's, it's the sour grapes that he's trying not to sound like sour grapes. You know, yeah. it, it, it just it, – I, I have him down, so it wasn't. I'm happy for him. I'm thrilled that that he, they broke the blacklist with this. But yeah, it, it's just it, it gets a little bit old. But, oh, uh, I, I hear you because I also the movie Trumbo explains it all. Yep, as well exactly, it, and yep. recreates it. And then you've got the documentary on here about the the ten, the Hollywood ten as well. Right, it goes a little bit deeper. But um, you're right, right. When it was getting broken down by Trumbo himself, uh, it yeah. was a little sour grapes and. Right. I'm still very happy for him, though, in the long run. Oh, time. yeah. Well, and, and the audio commentary, you, Sh- uh, Shane, you had mentioned that you enjoyed the introduction from for each of the people. Yes. I, that actually got old for me because – after a while, I know who everybody is, and it's like, okay, <laughs> Fair enough. I got it. You know, I, I I know when Kirk Douglas is speaking. You don't have to keep saying it's Kirk Douglas speaking. So you I know. guess you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and that's just old school commentaries. So it's fine. All right. Well, as Shane kind of said, this is what I love about Criterion: the these kind of extras because. I will agree that the commentaries and the trumbo scene by scene and the music composition, Shane, I will follow you. I watched <laughs> most of the trumbo. I watched very beginning of the, the music co- score composition. I was like, <laughs> ah, I'm done. I, you know, I'm not getting much from this. And that was probably the least interesting thing on the disc, but this is the kind of standard that I think criterion should hope to achieve in most of its releases that this kind of material, because they're the, not so much disc one, which is all the commentaries. The restoration demonstration is kind of interesting there, but disc two, the deleted scenes, the newsreel footage, I thought I got a kick out of that. Um, the 1992 interview with Peter Ustinov kind of spilling on some of the things that were going on on the set and how the actors were acting, and especially some of his stories about Charles Lawton, I, I thought it was really the voices. Very funny. Yeah, the voices. Yeah. Oh. No, I thought it was really, really good. Uh, the documentary about the Hollywood 10, not really so much about the film, but it, it was interesting. It was like a little side note. It wasn't extensively long. The storyboards, you know, I've seen that on other discs. I'm never that dazzled by it, especially when you start getting into the promotional materials, the lobby cards, the posters, and the print ads, because there's always just a subtle variation. This one's rectangular. This one's like a square, and it's the same image. And <laughs> It, that can get pretty tedious. I, I like the fact that they threw in the comic book, uh, but uh, I, I have to say, uh, you know, we've only reviewed two films for this, but this is this is the standard right now that I think most Criterion should follow. I would call this the Spartacus standard, if we will. Oh, yeah. So is it, there's you definitely get your money's worth with extras on this one. Well, and you you can buy this 
used for under ten dollars if you if you look for it. I mean, this thing has a history behind it that is is extremely easy to find if you're out there shopping for for this movie uh, in in excellent quality. So, yeah, this is well worth your money. Sorry, we go up to that later. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> Exit that out. All right. Well, Bobby, what the quality of the extras? You kind of said, you know, yeah, you, you got it, and that's something I will agree with. Is that there's a lot of repetitiveness to the information that's being discussed, especially in the commentaries. That the, the Trumbo stuff is that is already been covered in the commentaries, but then if you watch uh, the Peter Ustinov, he talks about a lot of the same things, especially uh, with the blacklist and a lot of that. Then you have a documentary about the blacklist, so right. it's. There, there. That is, you know, that's one of the interesting side notes of this film. And so, by the end of this, by end of watching all this, I went, okay, I got it. I, I have it for the rest of my life. I don't have to worry about learning it again. Um, but overall, the quality of the extras. Were you impressed with it? Yeah, the breadth of this, these two discs is amazing. They literally covered every angle possible. The only thing I could say that they probably, I wish they would have had, would have been. Was it Michael Mann? Who's the the original uh, director? I wish somebody would have been there on Tony Mann. Tony Mann, thank you. I, I wish they would have had him on there, uh, or or uh, not him. Obviously, he's dead. But um, but some you know his son or somebody that would have a biographer that would have been able to at least have some say on it. Not necessarily on the audio commentary itself, but it would have been nice to have that little extra that could have been a, another voice. But otherwise, yeah, I thought this was fantastic. I I would have liked to also have. Are we still? Are we doing? This is the quality, not yeah. what's missing. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the quality is absolutely fabulous i think and um i i just think that they covered as much ground as they possibly could with the surviving names for this movie and added some folks uh, that that were part of it so yeah i think that the quality is fantastic i don't think that they could have jammed much more into these two discs and still had the quality of the discs in the end so yeah i think this was excellent so as far as the quantity do you think this is uh, this is a great quantity or is this you know uh, it, it's it's a little much i think the quantity didn't necessarily have to be this broad but that said I think that everybody that speaks about it comes from their heart is they're not you know Peter Ustinov and and the novelist talking about the same thing it's two completely different people you have a you have the actor himself and then you have a novelist talking about the same scene and you're going to have two p- different perspectives and I think that that's very valuable when you are listening to audio commentaries is that you have one person saying okay this is how it worked and a, another guy goes well this is how I saw it and it was a completely different perspective so yeah I think that's I think those are valuable they aren't necessarily you don't have to have 13 hours worth of differing perspectives but i think that it was nice to have the option of if i want to listen to it well i've got something that's a really big missing issue that i'll mention later when we get to it so i'll go with just something that is when people listen to our criterion podcast they'll get to know that deleted scenes are really yep. my thing and especially for movies like this because much of the unused film you would think would be on the you know cutting room floor and just gone forever but luckily enough they restored it with some lost scenes but the actual deleted scenes on the disc were yeah, they're, they're a little bit um, thin on the ground mm-hmm. which which is fine which was a surprise I I actually like the fact that they had a 1960s interview with Peter Ustinov and a 1992 interview yeah. with um, Peter Ustinov, and there were two. They were just two different Peter Ustinovs, basically. And I loved that point. And the Gene Simmons interview on set, I thought it was interesting how they blanked it out for the local newscasters to put their own voices in as if they've asked the question, which I thought was interesting. I didn't know that they did that back then. Maybe they still do it now. And she called Lawrence Olivia Larry. And I thought that was pretty cool and um, saying that he was difficult to work with because, you know, she was so nervous around him being such a legend as he was. And then how she was also nervous around Peter Ustinov because he made her giggle. You know, those little insights you just don't hear about all the time. So especially from someone like Gene Simmons, who I was notorious not to do a lot of interviews, apparently. 
But, yeah, I actually liked the Hollywood 10 documentary because it did show – it just was a different angle from what we already know, I guess, or many people do know about the blacklist. Um, but the Gladiator School, it was just guys running around in tracksuits with Spartacus written on them to music, which – I could have done with only about five minutes of that, but it went on and on. Yeah, it, it was excessive in times. And I don't know if it's because I'm not an artist. I do appreciate storyboards, of course. But the Saul Bass storyboards, I mean, his opening credit sequence, as he's quite known for with lots of movies and different scenes in movies, was fantastic. But the actual storyboards, you know, obviously they they get transferred on the screen and they're, they're a different version. But I was surprised at how... Um, and sort of hat and reserved I was about and how good they were. And then when you got to Stanley Kubrick's drawings, they were like kids' drawings. Uh, they were just very simple. But I don't know, maybe it's lost on me when it comes to some of the art. You know, as I've already kind of stated, this is kind of the gold standard. I thought the, qual- the quantity of extras was amazing. And there were extras that I, I agree with Shane that I could, yeah, I care less about. But the fact that it's there, it's I rather have it there and not yeah. watch it or look at it, or yeah. have then rather than it not be there. And th- we each have our little things. I'm I'm kind of like Shane. My when I look at D- it, back when DVD came around, my biggest my three biggest things were commentaries, deleted scenes, trailers. That's what I wanted to see on every DVD. And if you didn't have those three things, I was different. Dis- disappointed it when blu-ray came about the fact that they were going back and re-releasing a lot of these films with making ofs or new commentaries but including the trailers i was like that's that's what i want to see so this hits the three elements to me i have way more commentary than i probably ever <laughs> needed to know about this film i have a few deleted scenes but this film actually went through a restoration process in 1991 and they had added like 14 minutes to the film then so I think the deleted scenes is you have what they didn't use in 1991, and I agree with Shane. The deleted scenes were not impressive by any stretch of the imagination, no. but I, I like to see them nonetheless, uh, considering the, a lot of the other deleted scenes. And I've only seen the version of the 1991 version, so I never saw it prior to that. My understanding is there was another version of this film that was re-released in the late 60s, where they took out like. 20 minutes of the film uh, made it a shorter film and that when they restored it in 91 91 it was the first time that that addition that 20 minutes was re re restored to the film and then they added the additional material like the tony curtis and um god I was olivier. Say, yeah olivier scene in the bath which uh i i don't know i i, I, I still to this day I, I know that it's Anthony Hopkins doing Olivier's voice since Olivier had already passed away when they had to restore it and they had to redub it. And they were saying, well, he does an amazing Olivier. No, he doesn't. He sounds like Anthony Hopkins to me doing that. <laughs> he says, like, yeah, it's like it's Anthony Hopkins doing that line. It, it just it does not sound like Olivier at all. It does not sound like the same actor no. in the film. But apparently uh, Olivier's wife thought he did a perfect impersonation. So whatever. But. I, I think the qu- uh, the quantity of extras is amazing. The quality of the extras, there's a lot of that's repetitive, uh, but what is on there is very nostalgic. The newsreels, I think, are great. I think they're just entertaining as all hell to watch that. The documentary about the Hollywood 10 was interesting, not something I'll probably watch again and again. But the the uh, what, one of the highlights, as I said, is the 1992 interview with Peter Ustinov, and uh, Shane referred to the the 1960 Ustinov and the 1992 Ustinov are two distinctly different actors. The 1960 very much doing promotion for a film, and 92 just talking about openly and honestly his experiences while working on Spartacus and. I, I think that's v- it's it's very informative. It's very very entertaining to hear him talk about the actors he worked with and the behind the scenes. I don't want to say antics, but kind of the side stories of uh, egos and um, you know the experiences of working with what, uh, as uh, Kirk Douglas said in one of the co- commentaries, the prima donnas on the film, and I think he was referring to himself as well. That there was a lot of big actors and people who wanted to have certain things happen in this film and it was always difficult uh, to make sure that everyone was pleased 
you had five actor directors on the yeah. set at the same time. Yeah, and I'm I sure mean, they all had their, they all had their <laughs> own perspectives. Oh yeah, what a combination that would have been. And and I forgot to mention the newsreel footage as well. I love that. It was like a step back in time. Mm-hmm. I really enjoy watching that stuff. Mm-hmm. All right, what about extras that are missing? Shane, I get the feeling that you feel something was lacking in this film or this yes, criteria. Yes, definitely. It won Oscars for costumes. And there's nothing here about any of the costume information at all, unless I missed something. No, there's I was not. really no. disappointed. You didn't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was right in the middle of that music commentary that you didn't watch the entirety of. That's oh, so you just missed it that, right there. That's what it is. Okay, well then I stand. I stand corrected. <laughs> No, that, that's a good point. That, that you know, they went to a lot of work. They won an Academy Award for this, and that there's no kind of uh, art or any kind of representation of the, how they came up with the costume designs or any discussion about it. That is no, no, none at all. Not fittings, because you know, you, you, back then they had um, sketches and fittings, and they videoed stuff. They actually filmed fittings back then as well the gowns and, and things that they were wearing. And then you had the Roman soldiers and yeah, I was very disappointed because um, the detail on the costumes were pretty good. And, and obviously they were, they won Oscars, but seriously, I, I, I looked, I thought I missed something, but now it's just, that's, that's the only thing I was really disappointed about. All right. Being missing. You're right, Shane. This is, this is crap. This is well, why did we <laughs> even watch this? I feel like I lost 14 years of my life or 14, sorry, 14 hours of my life. <laughs> The, it felt the quality like of this is definitely sets a bar high, and I'm not um, bagging the actual disc itself. But yeah, I just thought maybe a costumes documentary would have been good. Right. Bobby, any uh, nits you want to pick, like Shane does? I would have, <laughs> yeah, I, I would have liked to see more of the actors that didn't make the cut. I, I would have liked to have seen um, the original Verinia. Just, I would have liked to see some screen tests. Would have been interesting to see how that worked. Uh, I would have liked to have seen the original Tony Mann uh, dynamic somewhere in there. So those are the main missing pieces to me. And I, I guess my my nitpick is is uh, it's not necessarily the missing footage. It's I had a problem with accents and you know New York accent, Bronx accents in a movie. <laughs> I, just, I thought that the the casting wasn't the best, but that that's a, a different. I guess that's a different podcast. The, the Tony Mann one is a good issue because they bring him up a lot. Yes, and, and and even Kirk Douglas talks about him in the commentary, you know, openly. So you're right; that is another uh, missing piece that would have been quite good. <laughs> Well, and in the stills, they actually they noted in the stills that they had the original Verinia in there until they and, – and took several uh, still shots for publicity, and then she was replaced by Gene Simmons later. Yeah. And, and I would have liked to have seen the original – some of the original actor, actress uh, playing those characters. So that, that would have been nice to have seen just something. Well, and Occasionally, she, when Criterion release a movie from DVD into a Blu-ray version mm-hmm. over a period of time, they do add sometimes extra Blu-ray exclusive mm-hmm. uh, footage or content. Yeah. So maybe they could be included. You never know. Right. And I find it kind of amazing because obviously she got to the point where she was filming something, right. not only because of promotional stills, but because she's eventually fired. Do that because it's in one of the, I believe, one of the promotional stills. Commentaries, not the commentary, but the the written the written material right. that says that Kubrick tried to basically give her an incentive to do better in the performance by saying that she was going to be fired, right? <laughs> and then she fired, then he fired and, her, and then she froze up entirely, and then they end up firing or paying her for a couple of days of work, work. So obviously, the work she did was probably less than impressive. But it exists, and you would think at this point in time there would be something that you could throw on there. I mean, uh, I, I like watching the Eric Stoltz material from Back to the Future before <laughs> he was replaced by Michael J. Fox because it's just yeah. interesting to see a different actor and their take on the film. And there's only little bits and pieces of that that I've ever seen, but it's it's interesting. I, I agree with you. That's uh, It's not a glaring missing portion but it is something that i think could have especially with all the stuff you did add that you couldn't have thrown that in as one of the deleted scenes 
Well, and that's why w- when you bring up Eric Stoltz and, and Michael J. Fox is I think when you bring up Jean, Jean Simmons, Jean Simmons to me has always been a very wooden actress. She's very, very upright and, and proper, and, and it would have been nice to have seen somebody else with maybe a little more slave-like material that just happened to look regal. And I think that would have been nice to have to have seen that difference between those two women characters. Obviously, this is a male story, so you're not going to see a lot of difference there. But the females, it would have been really different to see Kirk Douglas's take, you know, I don't think they ever got to the romantic part of it, but when you've got these two actresses, I would have liked to see in that dynamic. That would have been really interesting to see him play off both of them just in just in one scene would have been nice to have seen. But again, nitpicking. <laughs> All right. Talked about extras that were missing. What about your favorite extra in the entirety of the Criterion? Bobby, there's got to be something on here that you say is your favorite thing to look at. 1992 interview with Peter Ustinov. <laughs> Hands down, it is the the thing to watch this for. Just 22 minutes of absolutely uh, – I was enthralled just watching a somebody who has an amazing wit, an amazing memory, and it was, it was fun to watch that. I, to be honest, I thought that was as good or better than the movie itself. It was just it, – it, it, it literally – I was glued to the screen watching him do that. Best part by far. Shane? Well, I have a fascination with classification. So reading the letter from the MPAA regarding the classification and the un- unacceptable content, I found it really intriguing because nothing has changed to this day. <laughs> and and I, I see actual things get said and, and things in media now, so it hasn't changed much. So that was very intriguing. But the best thing is exactly what Bobby said, I've got it in big letters on my notes here, the 1992 Peter Ustinov interview. I watched it back to back. It's very funny. It's just pure storytelling and mm. loved it. I mean, his 60s interview was fun too. He was doing like voices and, yeah. inter- you know, funny things. But as opposed to that 92 interview, that is, that's gold. I really enjoyed that. It's got to be my highlight. That could be on just, you could put that on as a special sometime and watch it. It's worth it. Yep. Well, it's going to be a trifecta for Houston off because that was my favorite thing <laughs> watching as well is that I love seeing actors, directors, of movie makers talk about their experiences, the behind the scenes stories. Not not that they have to dish dirt or, you know, right. basically bury another actor for their behavior on the set, but love hearing how that how normal that they can be, especially when they're making something as grand, something as long lasting as Spartacus is. And for him to sit there and talk about how Charles, like the experience with the, the, the two old ladies, uh, oh, that Charles him and Larry, yeah, uh, you know, uh, where they get him confused for Burl Ives. I thought that was a like, classic, <laughs> and how, how he, how he like gets crushed afterwards, and and then they try to they realize their mistake and try to come back and <laughs> Peter ma- Roman off, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just th- those are like really entertaining stories, and it's just I love one of the reasons I love Kevin Smith is that he's he's very open and honest in his commentaries, and he talks about his films all the time, and I love when he does things, and that that's what it reminded me of is him someone kind of just saying this is what we did, and it was I, I was a young actor, and it was a paycheck, and I enjoyed it, and these are the funny things that happened while I was on the set, and it's just. It's just so informative of what the movie making experience is. It does. It does not. It does not take away from the mystique, the mis- the mystery, the the glamour of making movies. But it humanizes it to me, and I always like that. Yeah. Oh, well, that's great that we all agree on that. Uh, who would have thought? It's really good <laughs> that we're all thinking alike because it was truly a wonderful, wonderful um, accompaniment to the movie. Yeah, and I wonder how much of that is that in 1992, I I honestly don't remember Peter Ustinov working too much around 1992 that, you know, a man in the later stages of his career saying, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I'll tell you all the stuff. And, and I don't even think his stories were that bad. I mean, there was nothing oh. r- truly scandalous. Some of it, I mean, the, the, you, you, you're not going to shock me by telling me, oh my gosh, the other actors had egos? <laughs> like that's. Yeah. Well, I liked how he mentioned about having some black tea with vodka in it under a, when the actors had it under his like, belt. Under, <laughs> it was yeah. very good. Yeah. 
All right. Well, it, let's talk about whether the film is worthy of a Criterion edition. And uh, Bobby, this is your pick, so we'll start with you. Is is this a film? This is Spartacus. Obviously, been around since 1960. Is this a film that was worthy of this much attention, time, and restoration for Criterion? I think the Oscars speak for it. Uh, the fact that it was that grand in its day, I think that it's it's the first non-biblical version of a Roman era movie. I think that that was an interesting choice. So uh, the fact that they have this much backstory that they were able to put on film for us to, to view, yeah, I think this is – beyond worthy i think this is i mean it's in our lexicon i am spartacus is used in movies in other movies so yeah I, I, this is definitely worthy of it and uh i i'm i'm thankful that criterion thought of this one because they could have made you know the uh, there's there's so many options that they could have chosen you know gladiator was a remake of this basically in, in some in a lot of forms so you know I, I think this was having this be the first having this be as grand as it is turning it into the the restoration that they did i think they made this movie better so yes totally worth it oh, I, I agree with everything bobby just said and yeah, Gladiator brought me back to Spartacus because, as I said, I never saw it in full. I'm sure I didn't. And, you know, you'd see clips from award shows or greatest movies of all time, documentaries and things. You'd always see things from Spartacus, and it's in the lexicon. Uh, you, you hear it in movies and television shows, I am Spartacus. So uh, I want to thank Criterion. I want to thank Bobby for choosing it. It's like Thanksgiving, and I don't even, like, celebrate it. But thank you for making me watch this again. <laughs> I absolutely loved it, and it is completely worthy. And I think if they do transfer it to a Blu-ray or a 4K version mm. at some point, pretty it'll be pretty amazing. It's just uh, it really does stand the test of time, and it's it's Hollywood history. Well, I will agree with you entirely in everything both of you just said that I did not own this prior to this, uh, basically the creation of this podcast. And, you know, Bobby said he wanted to review this one, so I had to actually go out and track it down. You know, I enjoyed watching Spartacus, but it was not an essential element of my library. This, is, as I said, this is the gold standard to me of what criterion should be and this the extras that are on this all the material that comes with it the commentaries the interviews the newsreels the production stills the additional documentaries all are just amazing and it is it, it's definitely a film that you know 58 years later that is as he bobby said is still in our lexicon and that they're remaking in into horrible softcore porn television shows yeah. uh, is somewhat a test of uh, shows the test of time for this film i'm not surprised that it was in a criterion version i was shocked at how good the criterion is because you're talking about a lot of material that is would have just eroded over time or would have been difficult to find so they really worked really hard to make a very very good criterion but comes to our last question would you recommend picking it up and i think i know what everyone's going to say shane well i'm certainly going to recommend picking it up and i mean i i got it for 20 dollars australian uh, and it's a great you know just a great package and i certainly think that people should think about buying it to add to their collection bobby this is an absolute yes uh, i i I originally had wanted to see this before we had ever talked about doing Criterion. And so when I went out to find Spartacus, I went, oh, I'll find a good version of Spartacus. So I bought this. That's how I, it ended up in my library. Uh, and it just happened to be a Criterion. And man, am I thankful I bought this version because it, you can find it for, like I said, you can under $10 US in on used online so well worth it uh like you said patrick this is the gold standard this really does have everything that a criterion should have uh so as far as i'm concerned there anything beyond this is just adding to uh, much less than this i think is now you're starting to kind of cut corners this movie has it all and i i I can skip over the parts that I don't want to listen to if I don't want to spend 13 hours. You know, <laughs> this is a great movie, well worth your time, and definitely worth a pickup. 
All right. Well, I'm going to be a little bit of a naysayer here. I love the film. I love the fact that I own it now. Is it? Do I recommend picking it up? God damn it, Criterion, why don't you make a Blu-ray version of it? That's my only complaint about it at this point in time, that it's only been released on DVD. I can only assume, although I didn't research it or try to find any information, that Universal's the rights have reverted back to Universal, and that's why Criterion is not you know, pumped out a Blu-ray version of this film, because the popularity is there. Uh, that's the one complaint I have about this. So the hesitation of should you go out and buy it now or wait to see if uh, Criterion uh, ultimately does get a Blu-ray version released in the next couple of years or so, I don't know. I, as Bobby said, you can pick it up for less than ten bucks if you're if you're careful and you're selective. You can find it out there. Uh, I I think for that price, it's well worth adding to your library, uh, with the qualification that when damn it when a blu-ray comes along you're going to have to go spend the 30 but 30 or 40 bucks to pick it up again so that but it's not the first time i've done that with a film won't be the last either well the fact that um in 2020 it's going to be what 60 years old maybe they're waiting for that yeah. you know that significant time and you saw on some of the footage uh in the newsreel that they were at man's chinese theater and you know could they could recreate recreate all that my thinking was that when, like Patrick said, if it ever does go to a Blu-ray, the key to this movie is the coloring, because if they there there have been some really bad restorations from straight DVD or or from the master, where the coloring has been worse on Blu-ray than it is on DVD, and the DVD that I that we own was nearly flawless color wise and as long as they keep those colors together on blu-ray i'm sure it would be a, an upgrade but that's really important when they do that conversion and update the trailer <laughs> oh yeah oh, yeah no, yeah restore that damn trailer <laughs> and you know but just to add also another thing to that this was released theatrically in 1991 there's a trailer to it where was the 1991 trailer i mean that obviously that's a good point well, and Criterion usually releases the trailers in 2001 when this was released, correct? Did I miss that? Correct. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, now that's that's a good point because when they do re-release classic films, they have separate trailers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I and I remember it. I I remember seeing a trailer at some point when it was re-released in 1991 because at that point that was right around the time that I was leaving working in the theater. And starting to work in block, at Blockbuster, so uh, I saw it at one place or the other. <laughs> it's a, someone show, showing a trailer for the restoration of Spartacus, because that's how I even became aware of it. All right, that does it for this month's review of Spartacus, or the Criterion Collection version of Spartacus. Uh, thanks again in, for joining us and listening to our little monthly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, including possibly what the new criterions are, information on, on upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network, including the other podcasts on our little network, the Golden Age of the Silver Screen, Male Bonding, The Number Two Review, Movie House Concessions, Movie House Memories, Lunchtime Movie Review, and Noirsville. Again, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you download us off either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Criterion Critics. Next month, we go on to Shane's next pick, and Shane has decided to steal one from what would have been one of my picks for a Criterion review, <laughs> and choosing 1993's Shortcuts, directed by Robert Alt Altman and starring everybody in Hollywood. <laughs> Until then, I'm Patrick. I'm Bobby. And I'm Shane. And don't forget, we are all Spartacus. <laughs>
This podcast is not endorsed by the Criterion Collection and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Criterion Critics, Miami Night's main theme, is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHM Podcast Network, Criterion Critics, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.